And now everyone, please put your hands together and give a warm welcome to your host, Tom Todia. That's great. I wasn't expecting applause for me. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Tom Todia. I'm a course director here in the Recording Arts Program, and it is my great pleasure to introduce to you our friend and fellow alumnus, Jonathan Dodge Mayer, Senior Music Manager of Sony Computer Entertainment of America, and he is going to be talking to you today about the music of Uncharted 4 uh, and a little bit more. So please give me a big round of applause. Put your hands together for Mr. Jonathan. And, uh, Hi, um, can we get the slides up? Thanks, Tom, and thank you, all of you, for being here. Uh, thanks to everyone who uh, has done so much work putting all this together. I've had an awesome week already, and it's only Tuesday. Um, really happy to be back here. Um, I got to talk to a lot of you yesterday at the career fair, um, and it was wonderful. Um, really appreciated you coming out and asking questions. And I'm honored to get to talk to you about a um, big project we wrapped up last year, Uncharted 4. Um, I originally titled this talk, Making the Music, and then I added a, a little addendum, because as you're going to see, uh, it was a lot harder than just getting the music made, uh, getting this project done. Real quick before I dive in, I'll just tell you a, a little bit about what I do. Uh, my title, as Tom said, is Senior Music Manager. Um, I, I work with a group of roughly 20 people inside of um, Sony Interactive Entertainment, and we're like a full service, almost independent music production house. And by independent, I mean we run our shop like a business, and we work with many, almost all of Sony's first party published uh, game developers, but we're providing a service to them. It's not mandatory that they use us, so we're very much a client-oriented service. Over the last few years, we've also expanded and worked with quite a few third parties. So uh, last year, I produced the score for um, the new Call of Duty game, Infinite Warfare, and um, currently working on wrapping up Mass Effect Andromeda with Electronic Arts. So uh, our client base is growing. It's a lot more experience for our team, um, and it's really wonderful. So although my job title says manager, as I told a lot of you yesterday, <clears throat> I'm really a music producer. And when you, th when you hear me talk about what we do, that's essentially the role I play within the group. And um, we do everything from beginning to end on a project, starting with uh, designing the score, the creative direction, coming up with the musical style. We help the teams find their composers and the talent they need, orchestration. We book recording sessions. We produce the recording sessions. We manage the mixing and frequently do it ourselves. We have a lot of great engineers on our staff. And at that point, where, say, a film or a TV show would normally be done with their score, we're about halfway. And as you'll see today, there's a lot that happens on a game this size. We probably make two to 3,000 edits of the final mixes. They go into the game. Um, we handle all the implementation on our team so that we have music-minded professionals actually scripting the music into the game. And then we're responsible for testing and iterating with the development team for the remainder of the process. So these are just a few um, select franchises I've had the honor of working on over the years at Sony. I've been there for 12 years. and. Uh, just having tons of fun. So I'll dive right in. Um, if you're familiar with the Uncharted franchise, it's been around for a long time, and it's a storied franchise with a lot of great history, a lot of awards. And that presents a real challenge for us when we're making you know, the fourth thing in a series, because we pride ourselves on innovation and uh, you know, being cutting edge and doing things differently. And we, you know, rarely want to do what we did last time on a project. And so with something like this that's been this successful, it's very easy to just say, let's do it again. Uh, it worked last time. And that's something we fight against uh, continuously on our team. So these are just some of the things I'm going to go over. You know, we had, um, it was the first Uncharted game on the PlayStation 4. And it was the first Naughty, Naughty Dog game. They're the developer. They also make The Last of Us that we had developed exclusively on the PlayStation 4. The Last of Us was ported um, as a remaster, but this was the first PlayStation 4 exclusive from Naughty Dog. 
So that, that posed a lot of challenges. Their whole engine had to, um, you know, be, be, had to address all that. And um, a lot of the music technology that we had come to rely on with them over the years um, just flat out broke and, uh, or didn't port over properly. Um, so we had a lot of interesting challenges there. We had a new director and writer on this project. And so that came with some interesting challenges too, um, just for us to, you know, luckily he's, he's someone we'd work with on The Last of Us, but just, you know, just to take that relationship into this franchise and see what happened. Uh, we had a new composer as well, and I'll talk about that in a little while. Um, and then things like tone scope and, and just the overall tech were all things we wanted to push. So tone is one of the most important things uh, I think any of us in this field can talk about at the beginning of a project. It's a question that I don't think gets asked enough, um, at least from my experience, in that if you're in a position like I am, or if you're a composer, or you know, you're a creative contributor on a project, your understanding of the tone is really important. And I think especially when it comes to audio and music, it gets overlooked a little bit um, compared to other disciplines. So if you sit down with a game development team and you look at their work in progress early on, they do these elaborate things, like they make color maps of their entire game, right? The color tone for every level in the game um, that's the kind of stuff that we should be doing for music, too. Um, whether it's looking at the big picture and the tone overall, or um, individual sections of the game. You know, is there a turning point in the game where we want the music to change, and do we want you know, spiritually to feel different after that's happened? Um, we had um, a different Nathan Drake in Uncharted 4, and I'm sorry if you haven't played it yet. I'll say shame on you first, and then secondly, um, I'm probably going to spoil some things. Nothing huge. I'm not going to show you the ending or anything like that. But there are some things in here. And one of them is just talking about where Nathan Drake is in this story. You know, we've come to know him over the years as a swashbuckling modern day pirate who loves adventure and, you know, is kind of always looking out for himself and then eventually gets sucked into these more altruistic endeavors um, while, while chasing fortune and glory like Indiana Jones or something. But um, in this story, we open later in Drake's life. He's married. He's given all that up. He's promised to give all that up, more importantly. And so tonally, uh, we wanted to be in a different place. The stakes are higher. When he does go off on this adventure with his long-lost brother, everything's much more serious right off the bat. And so that's something we had to address right away. And then that came with a level of emotional depth that um, we felt needed a little bit of a different treatment. And I like to show these examples. This kind of sums up everything I just said. When you talk about the previous Uncharted's, we look at Uncharted 3, and this pretty much sums up a lot of the tone. Can we get some more? Anybody else know? Yeah, thank you. Um, are we okay? Okay. So, anyway, you get the point. Um, that you don't even need the audio, right? I mean, the tone is. Pretty clear here. Um, this, it's a little dark. There's a gun sticking out of the sand. What happened? Um, but, you know, it's bright and shiny. Um, there's a sense of adventure. The music's really... Are we okay to keep going? Okay. So, um, this next clip sums up what was different. There we go. You keep waiting for the music to come on. I 
it's pretty clear, right? Um, so that was a good uh, jumping off point for us just to understand that. And it, it, even that decision right there, whether or not to have music on the main menu, was something we iterated on for a long time. We tried 10 or 12 different pieces of music uh, towards the end of the project. And we decided in the end that that made a lot more sense. So um, on this project, we had Henry Jackman. Um, these are some of his credits prior to Uncharted 4. Since then, he's done, he scored the Captain America Civil War movie. He's uh, scored the new King Kong movie that comes out next month. Um, so he's got a lot of experience. He was a tremendous asset to us. This is Henry's take on the lore of adventure. And this was like the second or third piece he wrote um, in the process. Um, that shorting is the cable, but I think it's in a good spot now. Um, so, sorry about that. Um, so, uh, hopefully, you know, you get it, like the, the lure of adventure, you get that feeling from this piece of music. And, and if you notice, there's a nice turning point in there, you know, when the string ostinato comes in, gets, there's a little more of a sense of danger associated with the lure of adventure. But the whole idea here is that you've got this guy, Nathan Drake, He's settled down, he's given up his crazy swashbuckling adventures, and there's this calling. And so even like the, the little flute riff at the beginning, you'll see in some examples I'm gonna play you that that's, that's literally adventure calling Nate out from his quote, ordinary life back to the, the world he knows. So I've got a video that um, just shows it literally cut from that suite playing back in a few of the cinematic moments in the game. So this is just a little montage and just listen to how, you know, we decided where to bring it in and where to bring it out and how it sits and all that stuff. How was your day? Oh, it was fine. Mm -hmm. Typical day in paradise. Mm -hmm. I uh, 
I got to pull a bunch of garbage out of a river. Mm. Yes. At least you got to go for a swim. <laughs> Did you find any exciting garbage? Oh, it was some brilliant stuff. It was a um, early 21st century truck we got. <laughs> Apparently, the natives called it a semi. Oh, dear Lord. Kind of so, boring stuff. Tell me about the article. Well, it started out as this fluff piece about tourism in Bangkok, but I don't think the magazine is going to like the angle that I'm taking because everyone immediately commented about how rude the smog was, that it was like shock to the lungs, like the second that you got off the plane. So, I kind of took this U turn. Ah! What? Where are you? I'm in here, being stabbed with a fork. Oh, really? <laughs> what? Just keep going. It was, it was interesting. Oh. Yeah. Interesting. What's my article about? This one? Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. I hope I don't go to hell for this. Shit. What? It's empty. What? Oh, you're such an <laughs> asshole. He's your brother. All right, skull and crossbones. Very good sign. Xavier's insignia. What is this? Uh, Odie mecum eris in paradise. Today you will join me in paradise. paradise. It's what Jesus said to Saint Dismas on the cross. Right. What about these numbers here? What do, you, what do you make of this? It's some kind of code or a phone number. <laughs> Come on. The dates. Huh? Look. 1659. It's the year Avery was born. 1699. Let me guess. The year he died. Well, uh, by most accounts, yeah, but that means we have date of birth, date of death, and paradise. Which means we're looking for Avery's grave. It's St. Dismas's Cathedral. <laughs> Wait a second. Hasn't Rafe been scouring that site for ages already? Yeah, the cathedral. See these symbols? Yeah. These are found on old Scottish gravestones. Right. Right? Now, look at this. The layout of this place is really unusual. Uh. Here's the cathedral, but the graveyard is way over here. <sighs> Rafe's been focusing on the wrong area. Exactly. Guys, we're going to Scotland. All right, all right. Wait, wait up. You do realize that Rafe knows you're coming. Yeah, we can deal with that when we get there. Look, that psycho would like nothing better than for you to show up. Plus, he's got Nadine and her whole army to back him up. Yeah, but he doesn't have this. The biggest pirate treasure of all time is within our grasp. I thought this was about saving Sam. It is. But come on, it's both, right? We need the treasure so we can save Sam. How is Elena cool with all this? So you can see, um, you know, how that kind of tracks the the progression through that scene too. I mean, we started kind of the same way um, in that second cinematic, but then it darkens a little bit as Sully's talking about, um, you know, Rafe's army and all that stuff, and then it kind of lightens up. And again, one cool thing I always notice when I watch scenes like that is like the the push in on Nate's face as they're discussing this really keeps the focus on Nate's perspective, right? And that's where we wanted to be narratively, too, is that this lure of adventure is all about Nate. So even though these guys around him might be confused or stressing out, it's like as he figures out this puzzle, the camera pushes in, we get more of a lift in the music. And that's all really important. It's subtle, but it matters. I'll give another example, the, the love-trust uh, pillar. And we've got a suite that Henry wrote called uh, Eros. He gave Latin names to uh, most of his pieces for some reason. Uh, I thought he was showing off, but. Um.
and I'll, I'll play you a, a little montage of examples on that one too, but before I do that, I want to point something out that I think is super important through all of this, is that we're talking about some pretty heavy concepts here. The lure of adventure, uh, love and trust, huge, right? How simple are these musical themes? Um, they're not dense, they're not, he's not showing off how great he can write. He's not, you know, writing a bunch of counterpoint. There aren't like a lot of four-part harmonies going on. He's capable of all that stuff, but if you're a composer, it's good to start thinking now that, um, at least in this medium, that you're communicating these ideas within the context of something bigger than just your music. And so, you know, it's great to have music that stands alone like this, but the more important thing is that it conveys the proper emotion within the product that you're writing for. And so I think Henry is one of the best at doing that and just keeping it really simple. And there's also an openness to it. Um, and we'll talk about the production in a little bit, but it's also how he voices things. Um, he's not, you know, it's, it's just not dense music in my opinion. So here's a montage of the, the love scenes. What do you think about that? <laughs> <Huh>? <laughs> hey, are you happy? Yeah, of course. You? Um. Um? <laughs> really? Come here. You know, even if you think that you're protecting me, you don't have a right to shut me out like that. No matter what it is, you're supposed to come to me so that we can work through it together as a team. I know that. Really, I do. It's just... I... I, I... You know, I... we should stay focused. There'll be time for this later. Next stop, New Devon. So check out the mix here. Just like old times, huh? Lena? Lena? Hey! Hey! Lena, come on! Lena! Uh, my hero. Oh, no, you didn't do that. <laughs> no! That's not funny! Oh. oh, you have done much worse. No. God, you gave me a goddamn heart attack. Oh, let me listen. Sounds good to me. Uh, you realize we're now even for everything I've ever pulled, right? Yeah, like ever. No, not by a long shot. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, you've got mud everywhere. <laughs> Anyone ever tell you you have a funny idea of romantic? Yeah. Yeah, I may have heard that somewhere before. Good talk. 
Okay, talk. More kissing than the average video game, but <clears throat> it works. Um, so also, I, I think one thing worth noting that I was just reminded of watching that scene was when we cut that. Again, these are all edits. Henry Custom scored a lot of the cinematics in this game, but these are all things that with his suites in hand, we tried his existing music against picture. And, you know, and we have stems and everything, so we can, uh, even that little kind of, um, the really dark, a uh, little intro to that in that last scene um, when he thinks she's badly injured or dead. That even came from the same suite. That's just a stem buried in there somewhere. So um, <clears throat> I love how elegant the editing is in that scene because the editor on our team didn't acknowledge the humor in that scene, which I think is really important because I think it's easy to get kind of Mickey Mousey and jump back and forth, but if you listen to it, there's just the through line. And um, I think that gives a lot more emotional weight to it as well, without you know sort of darkening it too much. Lastly, I want to show you an example. This is a great, one of my favorite stories from the project, which is the main theme to Uncharted, the thing um, that we were all singing uh, from that, that slide with the Uncharted 3 menu, was something we talked a lot about in this game. And we wanted to redo it because of all the tonal differences I mentioned. Uh, the presentation of it from the first three games didn't quite work against this game. So um, we worked on a title sequence that plays about 45 minutes or so into the game. And it, I'm going to show you a sequence leading up to that where Sam, where Nate and his brother Sam are breaking out of prison. And um, spoiler, Sam gets shot and falls and Nate thinks he's dead. Um, and uh, he, so he's running through the jungle. We have a treatment of the theme there. Um, in, again, in past uh, Uncharted games, this theme was never used outside of the main menu. Um, and one thing Henry took on as sort of a matter of pride was he wanted to use Greg Edmondson's theme, but he wanted to weave it throughout the story uh, for the brothers. And um, so you'll hear it not only in the lead up, you'll hear a subtle take on it in the lead up to the credits, and then you hear the credits um, I also want to give a shout out, throughout this presentation, I'm going to talk about implementation a lot. Scott Hanau and Andrew Buresh on our team are two of the world's greatest music implementers and did all of this work. And just this scene alone, um, there is a lot going on. And the smoothness of the transitions um, and the way it all works, uh, I hope you can all appreciate it as much as I do. So check it out. No. No, you hold on. Hold on. Sam. Give me your other arm. Come on, Reed. No. Sam. We gotta move. No, oh, no, he's still down there. No, he's gone. Come on, the boat's just beyond the wall. No. No, I can't. I can't. I can't leave him behind. Nate, your brother is dead. Either come with me or join him. Just have it your way. Sam. Oh, God, no. No. Shit. I'm coming, I'm coming. I gotta keep coming, right?
gets the, uh, oh, sorry. He gets the lure of adventure in there too, which is really cool um, there at the end. So, which was actually something he derived from his treatment of that theme. Uh, so that's fun too. Okay, so moving on, um, we'll just talk about our approach to production a little bit. So our goals when we produce any score, uh, I always, the way I always frame it is that um, if someone boots up our game and I'm in the other room making a sandwich, uh, the first thing I hear tells me exactly which IP, which intellectual property is in there. So it's a branding exercise. Um, and, and it's super important that that be done with regard to the overall style of the project. So in Uncharted's case, we have you know something that's billed as a Saturday morning pulp adventure comic, basically, or, or old timey you know Indiana Jones type adventure. And so there are limits to what we can do in terms of being super weird with the production. Um, but we did we did do some things that were different on this project. Um, we used a smaller string ensemble than we had in previous Uncharted's, and that was an idea Henry and I came up with talking about, you know, what could we do to give this project a little edge? And now for interactive and editing purposes, we do what's called striping when we record. So we have the whole orchestra in the room. Once they've worked through the queue uh, a time or two and we've made our notes and stuff, then we stripe it. And that means we take individual elements and have them play one at a time while the other players sit there. It sounds inefficient, but it, we actually go super fast doing that because we get to hear the cue in all its glory, but then we also get this really fine control in the mix and an editorial. So we might break things out like the short string passages and the long string passages, uh, low and high strings, the brass, you know, we, we might separate the melody so that if we're creating a loop of a piece, we don't have to play the melody every time you hear the loop, things like that. Um, this also allows us to do things like we did on this project, which is we had a 26-piece string section and I think 15 or 18 brass players. Now, if we recorded them all together, you'd never hear the strings. Uh, that's a lot of brass. So, um, but be because we were able to stripe it, we had this really cool, intimate string sound that was really edgy, and especially on the action stuff, they're a lot tighter. There's not so many of them, so you don't get that kind of swimmy vibe. So that was a big thing for us. Um, just real quickly, uh, just as an aside, this is um, the Call of Duty Infinite Warfare project scored by a phenomenal up-and-coming composer named Sarah Shackner. And she did like a synth hybrid thing. So her modular synths and things like that were part of her orchestra, basically. She also plays all the stringed instruments in the orchestra wonderfully. So she turned in a lot of mock-ups that were meant to be, excuse me, recorded by an orchestra with live parts already in there. And so we were augmenting that instead of replacing it. And her music was so bass heavy that I pitched this idea of basically putting the high strings in the back of the room, which they were super psyched about. <laughs> um, so we put all the violins in the very back of the room. But it was cool because even when we were striping and they were playing on their own, they were a lot further from the microphone tree at the conductor position and it just gave us a different sound. They sounded distant, they sounded far away, they had more of like an effect, a textural effect base, and then we got great low end and stuff out of the celli, which were right there in front of the tree. Um, and it just, you know, I mean, to the extent that it kind of just messed with the players a little bit, I thought that was cool too. We just got different performances, they reacted differently. And um, we also had the principal in every part of the string section with a pickup on their instrument, which was another thing we had to talk them into. And um, we reamped uh, a lot of the strings back at home. So that's our studio in the Bay Area. And we were running the violins through this Leslie cabinet um, on the right. So just you know, interesting ways to make your score iconic. Back to Uncharted, um, we relied really heavily on soloists, especially ethnic instruments, which has always been a big thing of Uncharted. Um, Henry works with a brilliant percussionist named Satnam Ramgotra, and Satnam played all over this thing. And as you're going to see in a minute, the percussion was a huge element in our implementation, and we needed a lot more percussion than the actual minutes of music we had in the game. So he had to layer extra percussion on every cue. So we worked with him a lot. We did, I don't know, eight or 10 days with him. And then the guy in the funny hat is uh, 
Henry's one of his co-composers, Alex Belcher. He's a brilliant session guitarist. And Henry brought in guitar as an element to this score too, which was really cool. And then we had ethnic woodwinds, uh, like we do in all the Uncharted games, sprinkled on top. Um, this is just a summary of what we did. We recorded at Air Studios in London. We did a couple different sessions. Uh, we partnered with uh, legendary mixing engineer Alan Meyerson on the mixing. So he came in and worked with us uh, so that we could keep our world, as he calls it, um, within the confines of our uh, system in our office. So you know we have this whole pipeline where mixing is kind of part of the implementation pipeline. And Alan really dug that and came in and worked with us. So he worked about four or five days co-mixing this with us, built us a template, and then handed it off to us. And then he reviewed all our mixes throughout the process. And uh, that was fantastic. I guess we only had 12 brass and 21 strings, so my numbers are off. So that's the production. Um, I want to dive in now for the rest of the talk. I'm going to talk about implementation, because that's the real interesting story, I think, on this project was going back to that slide where I said, you know, what are we going to do, do, do different? What's new? We wanted a more responsive and interactive Uncharted than we'd ever had before. So real quickly, this may be um, really basic for some of you, but I just want to go over this quickly. We think of interactivity in music in a couple different ways, and really simply broken down, it's vertical versus horizontal. So vertical may be two tracks, low intensity and high intensity, and they might be additive. Uh, we refer to that as and. And there could be more than two tracks. There could be five tracks. But basically, you've got virtual faders in the game driven by some type of you know, data from the game, which can be aggregated and then can drive a fader. Um, we can also do swapping. So we might have a stem that gets replaced by another stem uh, at the time that the transition takes place. Now, speaking horizontally, so the, some of the disadvantages to vertical, vertical in, interactivity I'll talk about in a second. Working horizontally, you get much more complex because you basically have branching in your music, and you have to think about all the possible places a piece of music could go. There's a lot more editing involved, and it gets much more complex, but we tend to prefer, prefer this over the other. Frequently, the systems we build are kind of hybrids of both. Um, we don't limit ourselves to one or the other. This is a screenshot from a mock-up, I think, from infamous Second Son, which we had like an open world music system that was pretty generative. Now, the technical way to display these kinds of systems is more like this. Um, that's the whiteboard outside my office right now. Actually, I had someone text me that this morning. Um, and if that makes sense to anyone, please see me afterwards, because I have no idea what happened. But <laughs> that's the music system for Mass Effect Andromeda, apparently. So on Uncharted, historically, uh, we had vertical interactivity. And one of the challenges there is audible fades. You can hear when the music comes in and out. And even if we do the best job possible with our editing and stuff, you still get a little bit of that in the mix. And you know, frequently, those transitions are covered up by gameplay events. But when they're exposed, they're pretty obvious. My preference when making a game would be to never hear a fade ever. It's, that's almost impossible, but it happens. We had a tension thermometer that basically aggregated a bunch of variables, like the type of enemies, the number of, the types of enemies, the number of enemies, the various weapons they were using, uh, the amount of damage you were taking in a period of time, and that all added up to some aggregate value that had thresholds that we could trigger um, the different musical states, right? High, medium, and low from, and that number was constantly following, falling. So we think of it as, there's a couple analogies for it. You can think of it as like a feather on a column of air in the game events, boost the feather up and it's falling. A lot of people describe it as a bucket with a hole in the bottom, but that's kind of how it works. So right from the get-go, the question we all posed is, how do we make this better? How do we do it differently? Let's throw out everything and start over. And we had all these great ideas. The gameplay in Uncharted was much more in Uncharted 4 was much more dynamic. So we had this stealth action component that we'd never had before. Um, the setups that these stealth action events happened in were more open. They were like big fish bowls instead of these linear paths that you had to go through. You could solve these things different ways. You could stealth through a whole fight. 
So um, we started looking at the AI states, and this is where the real story is because they had all these lofty goals for the AI in the game right from the beginning, and they were gonna have six plus states that they could be in at any point in time, and we'd have an aggregate value of that that we could tap into. Then I wanted to push it a bit further, and I spent all this time, and I actually talked about this the last time I was here, um, if anybody saw that talk in 2015, I've had this fantasy for a long time of getting more, in an action game, of getting more like an action movie. And when I watch a lot of action movies, I think about the angularity of the music in that, right? And they have the advantage of knowing from cut to cut what's gonna happen. So the hero runs down a hallway and there's a cool groove going and he stops at a corner and everything drops out and there's like high string tension and then he looks around the corner and some element comes in and then he jumps out of cover and we go back to you know, the, the, the groove or whatever. And so, the direction I gave to our team was, when something happens, do something. <laughs> and they did it. So um, that, but that really sums up like how we came up with this system. And I'll show you how it worked, or didn't. Um, so we had, um, we, we decided to take all the percussion and attach it to what I just described. So basically we're taking a big risk because something we try to avoid, which is you as a player, making things happen in the music in a very direct way by, say, taking cover or leaving cover or looking down the sights of your gun. And we decided to go with that. We decided to give the player more agency in the interactivity of the music. But at the same time, we had the AI driving the rest of the music. So the percussion and the groove elements are tied to all these player-driven events. The rest of the music is re reacting to what's happening in the AI. So these are the AI states, I don't know if you can read that, but it says like unaware on the left, search, combat. And this is, you know, live recorded, big, bold orchestral music. So we cut it up into the smallest chunks possible. These are usually like eight or 16 bars of music. And then we also have to have transitions that work between the different states. If you've ever tried making interactive music, it's really easy to go up in intensity because you're interrupting something kind of mellow. So you do it on a bar line, it sounds good. Getting back down is super difficult, right? Because the bottom just falls out. So we have all these custom transitions there. And then on the far right, we have all these percussion elements that we carved out and they go into a separate system. Now this is really under the hood stuff. So this is actually the music scripting engine, custom made, uh, that we've used at Naughty Dog for years. And I just wanna show you how this works. So this is how the chunks that are attached to the AI state work and any non-interactive music in the game, any of the scripted, uh, story-driven stuff is all scripted this way. So it's really simple, right? There's no pretty GUI here. It's just text-based, but it is super powerful. It's, uh, that's the name of the queue. We've got the volume in there, and we can, this is a playlist, this is one playlist of um, chunks. So this is the stealth action chunks for the low intensity state in one of those setups. So the volume of each chunk is adjustable. We've got a loop counter. We know which layer they go on if we were to stack them up vertically, which we can do in this system. We're tracking tempo because we want everything to be beat synchronous. All our transitions are beat synchronous. Unless something happens that we want to trigger immediately, then we can override that. Um, we've essentially got a time signature thing where we can say the number of beats per bar. And then this exit point, which I'm going to talk about a little later, but the exit point on a piece of music in this game became super, super important as we went along. And I'll tell you why in a little while. But that is the point at the end of the file where maybe there's a tail and it sounds good to start the next thing. Um, and so typically that's a beat synchronous event, but not always. So how do we combine the player states with um, the, you know, the player actions with all these AI states? This is the simplest way I can display this. So we have an unaware chunk. We're still in unaware. So that exit point says, okay, now it's okay to play another unaware chunk. The little crossover between those two is a nice musical tail probably. There's probably like reverb ringing out or something like that. So it sounds like one piece of music, but the beauty here is if you stay in that state for a while, these chunks can play in any order. So we're essentially remixing the tune on the fly. So instead of just a dumb loop that goes through, you're getting, you know, if we have 10 or 15, you saw a lot of chunks on that playlist I just showed you. 
we get much more variety out of the music. Then something happens. So on the next bar line, we play a transition, which has its own exit point, and now we're in search mode. The guys are looking for Nate, they're pissed off. Then something happens there on another bar line, and we go into combat. So that might be a different kind of transition. That might be a big swell and some drums or something like that. At the same time, a separate system <laughs> is handling all this percussion. So we might have a shaker, player takes cover, we add another element. Shaker keeps going. All these percussion elements are one shots. None of them loop. Some of the com them can play more than once in a row, but they're all happening all the time, and it gets really complicated because every time we do something in the percussion system, we gauge what's going on. So we might say, if there are three things playing, again, in the philosophy of when something happens, do something, if there are three percussion elements playing, we don't want any more, so maybe we'll just cut them all out. That's something, that sounds different. Maybe if there's two, we add one more to it. Um, and any sort of any variation you can think of on those kind of things was programmed into the system over time. And Andrew Buresh, who I mentioned earlier, I think still hates me because it was a lot of work. <laughs> um, so again, we, so we kind of have this layering. It's best displayed this way. This is how I explained it to the programmers. Um, again, it's good to be technical when you're presenting this stuff to uh, a bunch of programmers. So that's still on the wall at Naughty Dog somewhere. So separate from the Naughty Dog system I showed you, we have proprietary software uh, at Sony called Scream. And this is just a quick snapshot of what Andrew had to deal with. I, unfortunately, I can't go into too much detail here just because of time, but these scripts were so vast Scream was designed as a sound design tool, but it's been expanded to handle music functionality. But the paradigm for scripting in Scream is still sound design based, so it's based on these things called grains, which are individual scripts that can be bundled together. And so Andrew quickly um, broke Scream because he made too many events, and he found out that there was some limit to the number of, of events because the amount of uh, bytes they were allowing for, for a Scream script. And so he's famous right now with the Scream team for being the guy who forced them after 20 years or something to up the limit. Um, so these are just, this just kind of explains what's going on. I'm gonna button through this pretty quick because I'm not even sure I understand it fully. But it required, uh, the point here is that this was a ton of work. Um, our team logged over 7,000 hours on this project. Um, and that doesn't count people like me who don't bill overtime, right? So who knows what actually happened. Um, so this just kind of sums up the system. So there, there's the limit there. Andrew hit the limit of 32,768 scream grains. Uh, each of those is a line of script. Uh, so they bumped it up to some number that, of course, they think will never hit now, but we'll see about that. Um, I don't know what the new number is, but we're going to find out. So, like all good systems, we came up with a name. This helps sell it to the team. This is FRAGS, the Fast Reacting Adaptive Groove System. And once we got it all in the game, it didn't work. Not a bit. So the first problem we had was that Scream and the Naughty Dog system were running on two different clocks. Games run at a frame rate. The Naughty Dog system was clocked to the game, 60 frames a second being the fastest it would go. Now historically, because our transitions were beaten bar transitions, that was close enough. There was a little wiggle in there, but you never notice it. And even if you were transitioning to something and there was a little bit of flutter, the other thing was fading out, so it kind of didn't matter. And we could never hear the difference. And the programmer warned us going back 10 years, you know, hey, these things aren't super tight. And we were always like, ah, don't worry about it. Scream runs at some insane, insanely high clock rate. It's, it's based on its own internal clock, and it runs more like MIDI, where it's tick-based and it's running faster than you know, any of us would hear. Now, because we were layering up percussion parts and really spare percussion parts, like a shaker and one hand drum, you could hear, I'll let you hear it, actually. It's 
one part. That didn't sound too bad, but it's a little flammy. This one's awesome. I'm a drummer too, so this kills me. So uh, we thought about changing the name of the system because uh, we had a frequently latent adaptive music system. So we started calling it Flams until they, they fixed it. So they fixed the clocking problem, but then we had another problem that had a better acronym. And if you can say that, uh, I, I can't say it. But um, we got all that working, we got it in the game, and then uh, we started getting massive quantities of bugs, which like, you know, music guys don't get a lot of bugs typically on a, on a project, and when we do, it's like some designer saying, I think there should be music when this happens, and we're like, waved. Um, <laughs> but, but, these were legitimate bugs, and I'll show you a couple of them because they all came with captures uh, attached to the email. So here's one. Put them down! If you look in the upper left hand corner, you can see the tension and mood things. That shows you what we're going for in the music. Watch the mood. <laughs> Sounds great, right? So here's an even better one. So after the thousandth email, you know, dude, your music's broken, uh, we walked around and talked to a whole bunch of people, yelled at some people, um, bought some people lunch, and found out that the AI was broken, and the music was doing exactly what it was supposed to do, and they, wouldn't, they would have never known. Um, so we started having meetings with uh, music guys and AI programmers, which rarely happens, but that was fun, um, and we had one every day until we sorted this out, and the reason that um, that those, the tension and mood are two different elements now is because th th there are things happening off screen with the AI that nobody would have known about had the music not been reacting that way. And so what they did was they created a separate value just for music. And they created hysteresis, which is a way to you know, track the frequency with which change is happening and basically block it um, in certain instances. So. It's a lot more complicated what they did than that, but that's sort of me dumbing it down for me. Um, and, and that's how I came to understand it. So if you've played the game, we did fix this. Um, and I'll show you some examples. It got fixed really, really, really late in the process. I've never been as terrified as terrified as I was, but um, I also had a lot of faith in Naughty Dog and our team, but we worked really hard on it. Now, the biggest, these are just some stats, I'm not gonna read the slide to you, but it's interesting. Um, the biggest challenge, actually, for us was we conceived of this system in the bare form probably two years before the game ship, two and a half years, and we weren't able to test it totally working until about six weeks before the game went off to be made into Blu-ray discs. And the problem with that was we were making assets for this system with no idea what they sounded like playing back. So we were testing things on our own outside of the box. And so uh, a guy on our team named Anthony Caruso, who's a brilliant engineer and editor, 
did a massive amount of editing at the last minute to sort of touch things up and tailor them to the system. In a perfect world, we'd have the composer involved in this discussion and sort of tailor some of the cues to the system, but never been to a perfect world, so. Uh, here are a couple of examples. Um, in this example, we start with stealth. Um, you'll hear a bunch of stealth kills. So you'll hear, and it's subtle, and that's the point, but you'll hear the percussion responding to things the player does. And then um, at some point, he's gonna trigger, the player's gonna trigger the switch to investigate mode, which is a slightly different intensity because they're gonna find a dead body. And then um, we switch over to another part of the game uh, where there's a lot more stealth. It's a different piece of music, so you can just hear this working under a variety of sort of compositional uh, systems. Oi, oi, target. Saw something, maybe. <coughs> Movement along the three line. Well, that's thick jungle over there, eh? It's all moving. I don't see anything. Damn it. All right, everyone, false alarm, but keep an eye out. Let's go. And the gang's all here. <coughs> One of them takes the ball. The older brother. He shot a couple of our men and ran off. Is the other one's alive. So if we find a body, I'm gonna go with yeah. I'll take the white man direct. The kid's getting lucky. We'll see. What is that? Someone took him out. So now they're going to switch to investigate. He's here somewhere. So that flute shift was something when Anthony went back and re-edited the cues, he moved from the proper chunk part of the cue down to the responsive percussion stuff because he thought, hey, it'd be cool if this played when I choked a guy out. stop there just naturally and I think that adds to the tension too.
So I'm gonna trigger combat here in a second when he walks around the corner, so listen for that. What the? What's that? What the? And then you'll hear a transition back down here. Now you'll hear how it ends. Got this son of a bitch. Nice shot. Hey, Nate, let's go before more shoreline show up. Hi. Right. Now, let's get that bridge down. So I think the coolest thing that came out of all these meetings with uh, the AI guys is that more folks started coming to these meetings because we started to discover that when this worked right, other th weird things happen, like the dialogue that triggers at the end of a fight and the change in animation posture from you know stressed out and in combat to just walking through the jungle. Um, all those things were happening on the same game frame. Fight ended, music end tag was triggered, dialogue line was triggered, animation was triggered. We started complaining about that in the meetings and the AI guys pulled in more people and actually, those exit points that I told you about in the musical file became the guide to trigger the dialogue, which then in turn triggered the animation change. So we actually had control over all that, which was amazing. Um, and we went mad with power. Um, <clears throat> no, but it, it's the right way to do it. I mean, if you watch a film or you know, a TV show or something where this is done right, and next time you're planning a game, I think this is something that people aren't doing enough. Um, you know, there are a lot of games where you finish a fight and the audio, the barrage of audio things that happen is overwhelming. You know, there's dialogue and a stinger and all this stuff and it just goes um, because a bunch of disparate groups of people who weren't talking to each other did their work and got, you know, the last frame totally nailed. Um, I had another example, but I'm going to skip it in the interest of time. And it's a lot like the previous one, but uh, it's cool. So um, again, we created a lot of challenges for ourselves, you know, somewhat inadvertently throughout this project, but it led to what we think was a lot of innovation. So um, you know, managing the transitions the way we had to um, and the way you heard was something we didn't really expect going into it. We had all these limitations for how many pieces of music we could cue. So there are a lot of things built into the system. If the, you know, the things I told you about were like, if the AI is going like this back and forth, we had to make sure you know, that in order to, because we're pulling everything off the disc, streaming wise, we, we have to buffer stuff before it plays. And so we have to make sure that you know, the next piece of music's ready in time. And if the AI is changing its mind about what's gonna happen next, we had to basically have like a point of no return where you know, whether the system tells us to or not, this is what we're doing next, and then maybe on the next bar line we could switch. Lastly, when we thought we were done and all this was solved and we were testing the game, we'd scripted the whole game, we discovered another problem, which was that they did something on Uncharted that they'd never done on a Naughty Dog game, which was they had in-engine uh, tra visual transitions between adjacent cutscenes. So if there was, say, a cutscene at the end of a level and then the cutscene for the beginning of the next level, they put fades in between them visually. Now, our music was always connected. It's playing out of the game. It's not, it's not baked into the, music, the audio mix for the cutscene. And that's so we can do beat synchronous transitions. The, post, the people doing the post-production mixing for the game would take our music stem, bake their rides into it in a mix, and then give it back to us. 
So the start of that scene, which is a checkpoint in the game, was the gospel as far as sync goes. But then this happened. And the even better part is no one told us this happened. And we had 106 cutscenes and close to three hours of content. It was like two movies to deal with. And so um, another system was developed to solve this problem. So I'm just gonna show you one last example and then we're gonna go to Q&A. And this is um, this finally working. So basically what happened was someone, some programmer, because this was, this was a little different than the AI thing where people were pointing their finger at us. They knew right away what had happened. And a programmer in all his brilliance stayed up really late one night and basically just made a list of everywhere in the game where this happened and put essentially sort of an invisible checkpoint in where the second movie actually started. And so we could select whether it was the checkpoint or the start of the actual movie file and saved us from re-editing three hours of music with three days or something like that to go. So we're in gameplay here. Now we're in a cutscene. So that was the first crossfade you just saw, but there was no music playing, so it was okay. Well, that was a close one, huh? They shot up my goddamn plane, mate. We're fine, thanks. How soon can you get us to Madagascar? No treasure, then. Not yet. I don't know what you're talking about. Look, we're rich. Jesus. I suppose it's a start. You think the rest is in Madagascar? Well, there was a chamber back there with a giant map of Madagascar on the floor, so, yeah, it's probably there. This is beginning to smell a whole lot like wild goose, kid. Look, the treasure was never in Scotland, okay? Then what was the point of all that, huh? Of the St. Dismas Look, Cross? it's like I said. I think Avery was recruiting people. The cross was an invitation. The caves were just some sort of uh, initiation. Oh, so we all passed, huh? Congrats, Victor. We get eye patches and parrots now. I don't get it. Why the hell would they go to all that bother just to weed people out? To protect himself. Look, Avery was the most wanted man in the world at that time. He had to enlist people that he could trust in order to keep their treasure secret. What do you mean, their treasure? Just think about this. Thomas II was a successful pirate in his own right. What would he possibly stand to gain from joining Avery? I think Avery sent out crosses only to the other wealthy pirates like himself. What if they pooled and hid all their treasure together? That would make the guns way all look like chump change. Exactly. Oh, holy shit. Okay, so where exactly in Madagascar are we going? Kings Bay. It was an old pirate haven back in uh, Avery's time. I know it well. It's a big place. Anything more specific? Well, that map chamber completely caved in, so, you know, <laughs> what are you laughing about? The people who survived the caves, the recruits. What's the one thing they would have left with? There's a volcano on this. There's a volcano near King's Bay. Which means we need to get a move on. So in the interest of time, I'm going to kill that. That scene goes on for a while, and there's a couple more transitions in there, but uh, I think we're running low on time, so. Yeah, we have a moment just for one or two questions, and I'm going to go to, oh, I can we get the closest one in here. Hey, how you doing? Um, Zachary Cook, met you yesterday. Um, 
Just over uh, a general question as to where we're going in the future with uh, music and sound effects within video games. Um, if you look back to the 8-bit area, you know, when MIDI was introduced and then compressed files and stuff like that in the more modern age, where do you see it going? Like, you know, with the 7.1 and virtual reality and stuff like that, uh, is it going to be easier to implement the music and the sound effects or are we going to have to build all new stuff for everything as time goes on? Thank you. Number two. <laughs> I, you know, I, I think that, um, real quick, I mean, I, I do believe that, that the answer is a little bit of both. It's a great question. It's a super question. I, I think that um, go we're seeing, you know, more innovation with regard to middleware. More people are adopting those kinds of things. So there's, there's a fair amount of standardization with these things. Uh, Naughty Dog's a very rare bird in that they build all their own tools and stuff, and um, they're amazing. So why would they change? And they're way ahead of a lot of what we could do with middleware and stuff like that. But I think um, some of those problems are being solved. But I think when you're on the cutting edge on a project like this, that you're always basically going to be pushing everything into a state of complete brokenness and then pulling it back together. So I think when it comes to really innovating, that these type of challenges are going to persist. At least I hope so, because I, I feel like, it, for me, if this gets easy, then we're not doing our job. So. Uh, I have a question from our live chat. Michelle, a music business um, major, is asks, being a music su music supervisor for gaming industry is one of her dream jobs, uh, but right behind film and TV. She knows that, that it's different than what you do because you're more of a music producer or a producer. But how or if you do, how do you interact with music supervisors? Um, well, again, our our department is. Uh, kind of unique in terms of the robustness of the services we, we offer. So in my world, um, we have one in our department. We have a business affairs division of our team. And so we have um, a guy named Alex Hackford on our team who is a phenomenal music supervisor. And that's how we solve those types of tasks. watching the microphone. There it goes. It's, it's almost there. Here it comes. This will be the last question. OK. Um, hi, I'm Zachary Wright. I'm in the music production. And recently, one of my friends has been talking with one of his game buddies and wants to make a horror game and asked me to do some of the music for it. My question is, what would be some of your advice to tackling this? Well, I think the things we talked about at the beginning of the talk are uh, really good places to start. So I think your job is to make sure that the people you're working for and yourself understand the tone and the end result that they want from you musically. Um, if you're being asked to put music into anything, any piece of media, the first question you should ask is why. And I don't mean, why do I get to do this? But I mean, why? Why do they want music playing right there at that time? And what are they trying to accomplish, right? And I think that question permeates all of this. Um, what am I trying to accomplish? You're not writing music for music's sake. And I think that's the most important thing to remember. OK, let's have a big round of applause for Jonathan. Thank you guys. Thanks. And make sure you play Uncharted 4 if you haven't yet. <laughs>